Welcome to the Dr. Berkson's Best Health Radio Show. This is going to be a really great show, and I have a personal, a personal connection with this show because I've been diagnosed with cancer several times. Hmm. When I was younger, I battled multiple cancers, and we have on, you might even call him a cancer whisperer, but we have on the show Dr. Robert Nagorne, and this is all about functional profiling and why you should care if you get cancer. So let me tell you a little bit about his background and why you're going to want to sit up a little bit, or if you're taking a stroll around a lake, you might want to sit down on a bench and really focus. This is an important show. And don't forget, I'm talking to you from Naples. I'm not in my professional studio. I'm working here at the Naples Center for Functional Medicine, where I've just initiated a renal center. But today's topic is cancer. And we are honored to have this physician with us. Dr. Robert Nagorne has been internationally recognized as a pioneer in cancer research and personalized cancer treatment for over 20 years. He's the founder and medical director, and we're gonna really take a deep dive into what this clinic is all about, the Nagorne Cancer Institute. And he's been on a clinical appointment at one of my favorite institutions. I love the research that spews out of the University of California Irvine School of Medicine. There are agile thinkers on that campus. He's a practicing oncologist and triple board certified in internal medicine, medical oncology, and hematology. And among his many accomplishments, he was a co-investigator on the National Cooperative Trials, number of cancer trials. He's recognized for the introduction of some chemotherapeutic interventions, cisplatin, and I'm not even sure I'm going to pronounce the other chemotherapeutic med right. I'm going to let him do that. But two different chemotherapeutic medicines in the treatment of advanced ovarian and breast cancers. So he's got more than two decades, two decades of in-depth experience in humor tumor primary culture analyses. He's authored more than 100 manuscripts. I only have a few peer review articles out, and I know that each one took a few years, so that's a lot of elbow grease. He's got book chapters, abstracts, including publications in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. That's a top peer review journal, gynecologic Oncology, another top peer review journal, and two more, the Journal of the National Cancer Institute and the British Journal of Cancer. We have a major cancer expert who has a breakthrough in cancer treatment. So welcome to the show, Dr. N. <laughs> well, Dr. Berkson, thank you very much for having me. Would you please just tell us what makes your clinic and your work different than other cancer centers? Well, everyone in the cancer field is interested in what we now call personalized or individualized medicine. The idea is we don't want to generically treat people. We want a unique therapy for each individual based on their biology. The problem is the closest we get to that is genes. We look at genes. Genes are given to you by your parents, and they give you kind of a blueprint of what you might do. But for anyone who's ever built a building, you'll know that you start with a great blueprint and wind up with a crummy building because the contractor doesn't do it right, and he doesn't read the blueprint correctly, and he puts it in the wrong place, and you wind up with something that doesn't work. Biology is messy, and in order to figure out what the genes are telling you, you have to know how they were read out and how they were used for the final product. We're interested not in genotype, what makes your genetics, but phenotype, what you biologically are once all those genes are read and put together into a functioning person. Could so you make a little bit more of a distinction for people out there? They might not get that, but that is an important distinction, please. It's, it's fundamental. It is absolutely the basic difference between us. Remember that DNA is a blueprint. It's just what you might be. It's like a idealized building. It's one of those pictures that you look at, but nobody buys a house until they take a walk through. And your body is a physical entity. We need physical biological information. So what we've developed and what we use are techniques that measure biology, not informatics, not satellite photographs of reality, but the Google map, 
the real functioning day by day existence that we all live. Everything looks great from 300 miles above, but it's down at the nitty gritty of biological existence that we have to treat patients. And that's what we've really done. That's the breakthrough. We study biology, not theoretical science, not gene profiles, but biology, the actual occurrence. What happens when a cell is exposed to a drug or a targeted agent or a combination? What happens in real time is what we can now uniquely measure. So if a person is diagnosed with cancer and they're, it's like, it's like once you get that diagnosis, it's like running into a brick wall and they come to see you for the first time, scared to death. What is it that you're going to do to begin these measurements? Well, when you get a diagnosis of cancer, people say it's like being in a bubble. Suddenly there are the people on the outside and you're on the inside and nothing that they say seems to matter. What we need to do is to get down to their personal experience and find out what drugs, what combinations, what targeted agents, what metabolic inhibitors are going to influence their outcome. And to do that, the patient, when we meet or when we consult, the patient comes to one of our surgeons or radiologists and we conduct a biopsy. We actually get a little piece of that patient from the body into our test tube. When that occurs, after we've reviewed the patient's Is that a biopsy of the tumor you're talking about? Of the tumor, of the cancer. So this won't work if they've already had the tumor removed or the nodes removed, et cetera? Right. Sorry about that. We work in um, biological systems and we need tumor tissue. We don't use blood unless it's leukemia where the cancer cell would be found. Otherwise, it's solid tumors. And these are used to isolate the cancer cells in what we call three-dimensional organoids. Organoids are like little mini organs. So we take the patient's tissue from the body with the surgical biopsy or sometimes with fluid, patients accumulate fluid in the abdomen or the chest cavity, and we aspirate, we remove it into a bottle, and then we use uh, either enzymes or mechanical means to get the cells out into these clusters, these little groupings. And those clusters are perfect rep- representations or reproductions of the patient's tumor in the test tube. So now you've got their cancer in our test tube. And with that, with those cells sitting in media, just like they're still in the blood, just like they're still in the body, for a period of several days, the cells don't know where they are. They think they're still inside your liver or your lung. And we then place them into an environment of drugs and combinations to see what happens. What do the cells do when they're exposed? If the cells are happy and they're swimming around in nice warm blood-like media in an incubator, then at the end of several days, the cells are fine. They're having a good time. That's not a good drug for you. But if the cells have suffered serious injury and lethal injury, and that's called programmed cell death, one form of which is called apoptosis, if the cells have suffered programmed cell death from the treatment, then those cells will die. And at a period of three to four days, commitment to death can be measured biochemically. When you see it, whether there is ATP production, activation of caspases, delayed loss of membrane integrity, loss of mitochondrial function, we have different endpoints, but once you see that, you know that that drug has caused damage to that patient's cells in the test tube and that damage will do the same thing in the patient's body. So is this care covered by insurance? Is this brand new innovation that isn't covered by insurance? How does all that work? Well, some insurances cover the test, but the test itself isn't all that expensive. The drugs that we test are all covered by insurance, or mostly. And what we do is we serve as the conduit between what you should get and what you, what you, what's out there. And some insurances will cover the test costs five or six thousand dollars at one time. And it will tell patients what to do. Now remember that most chemotherapies cost five or seven or ten thousand dollars every time you take them. So the benefit of knowing what to take and saving that kind of money on, on drugs that don't work is enormous. Uh, you know, the average drug today approved by the FDA is over twelve thousand dollars a month, pills. So you're finding out which personalized chemo intervention is going to really be efficacious for that tumor. So what are your success rates of your patients for a variety of tumor lines compared to other people with the standardized care where they're not doing this individualized approach? Well, we have published our results in many diseases, including breast and ovary and lung and leukemia. And we also published an analysis of over 2,500 peer-reviewed 
published outcomes. So these are people who went into their doctors, had a biopsy, we did the study, and then we followed to see what happened. Did they do well with the drugs we recommended or not? And when we looked at the end of the study, we found that in over 2,500 patients, if you got the drugs that we recommended, you were two times, actually 2.04 fold times more likely to respond. And that's statistically significant at P.001, which means that it is highly, highly significant. And secondly, the people who got the right drugs had a 44% higher chance of being alive a year later. And that's P.02, again, statistically significant. So we've proven that if you take the right drugs, you are statistically significantly, A, more likely to respond and B, more likely to be here a year later. You know, this makes so much sense. It just makes common sense. So you wonder, how come this happened with you? Why hasn't this happened before? Well, actually, um, many people have wanted to do this. It turns out that this isn't the idea of this is not new. The first paper of this type was published in 1954. And way back in 1954, there were all of five drugs available for people to take. And the doctors who were working in a field related to mine said this would work to pick drugs. And everybody said, who cares? There aren't enough drugs to use. It doesn't matter if you pick them, you can give them all. So for the next decades, everybody developed drugs. Now, during those decades, we became increasingly interested in genomics and DNA and chromosomes and all that sort of stuff. And we migrated away from a test that actually worked into tests that were driven by cell growth, proliferation, DNA synthesis. We incorporated all the new science into these techniques. Well, the trouble is cancer as a disease isn't a growth problem. Cancer is not a disease of cells that want to grow, proliferate, make DNA. Cancer is a collection of cells that don't want to die. Immortal cells, right. And so when cells don't want to die, measuring what stops them from growing is irrelevant. And most of the tests that were applied over the decades since the 50s measured growth or DNA synthesis oh, or proliferation. So the tests were done in a bad way and everyone lost interest in the field for the wrong reason. If you go back to the very beginning, if you go back to the very beginning, you will realize that the people who did it right in the beginning actually used cell death. They had never heard the term apoptosis. They knew nothing about programmed cell death. They knew nothing about what actually made our test work, but they used it by accident. They used something that worked and all the subsequent tests that were done were done rather foolishly based on cell growth and cell proliferation. And as so a result of that, those tests didn't work and everyone walked away from the field except me and a couple of colleagues. Just for those that are listening, now we have a lot of doctors that listen, a lot of pharmacists that listen, but we have some really smart, regular folks out there. So all cells, they have a growth cycle and they're born and they act, they do functions and then they die. That's what he's talking about. But cancer cells don't want to die and therein lies the severe problem. Exactly, exactly. Where cancer distinguishes itself from normal cells isn't its growth rate, but its death rate. Right. So, you know, I... I I wonder there's a few people that are taking a walk down a park or they're in their home on a couch listening to this and they are battling with cancer, but they already lost their tumor load from surgery and they're out a few years out and they don't have access to those tumor cells. Is there any kind of immunotherapy that you can do based on their present situation or are they out of luck or how does that work? Well, any cancer patient who has been rendered free of disease is in a good position. And we're happy if they don't have any cancer cells to study. And we're happy if they don't have anything uh, to be evaluated. If they recur, if the disease recurs, then we would certainly gladly test them and run studies. In the meantime, we now know that cancer is the interplay between our metabolism, our biological functions and how we provide nutrients and growth factors to cells and immune surveillance. So one of the findings in our new metabolism studies is that many people who develop cancer have immune dysregulation. And that's part of the reason why contemporary immune therapies work is because you can upregulate a sleeping immune system. It doesn't work for everyone, but when it works, it's beautiful. Now, people who are free of disease, if you have what's called no evidence of disease, NED, Generally, those people should lead a healthy, uh, productive life and, and hopefully not recur. 
there are um, ways to improve immunity through nutrition, lifestyle. Uh, but for the most part, one does not need to treat disease unless there is some evidence that it is still persistent. There are adjuvant uses, post-operative uses of immune therapy uh, in melanoma today. Um, we use immune therapy to prevent a recurrence. Yes, that's possible. But I would say for now, if someone has had surgery and is free of disease, they're in a good position. That's a, that's a good thing. Okay, so you don't really think that ca lurking cancer stem cells are an issue or something that you're actively identifying in some way? Well, you know, that's an extremely interesting question. And at the level of cellular metabolism, at the level of what makes cancer occur in the first place, we have found that if you study patients' biochemical and bioenergetic state, that they have a predisposition to cancer that occurs before the disease and persists after the disease. And we have written about this in a paper in Target in 2018 on manifestations of inborn errors of metabolism. Are we all suffering cancer predispositions? I wrote an editorial about it, and I said, you don't get cancer. You have cancer. It's just a matter of when you find out. Oh, I want to read that paper. I want you to send me that paper. That sounds like I'll something I'd be very in interested in. Yeah, you know, sure. one of the things I'd love for you to share it, it are a few patient cases. Many people listening have gone through breast cancer and so forth, but then there's the cancers where they usually have a very short lifespan left. And we have some patients that are still living, but are battling ongoing pancreatic cancer, the really nasty cancers or glioblastoma. Could you share some of your experiences with some of these diverse cancer types? Sure, sure. We've treated just about every kind of cancer. I, I, we've done over 10,000 patients. So we've, I would say we've tested almost every cancer there is. Um, we are very interested in cancer of the pancreas. As you may be aware, this disease is skyrocketing in incidence. 55,000 plus people per year, advanced disease with a 1% five-year survival. It's a, it's a disaster. We do have some uniquely good stories in pancreatic cancer on one patient that came to me many years ago had such advanced disease that I, I, I couldn't imagine I could help him. He was on the highest doses of narcotics I've almost ever seen. I had to give him two liters of fluids, IV, every other day just to keep him hydrated. He couldn't eat. He went to the major centers in Southern California. There are some very famous cancer centers here, the City of Hope, USC, UCLA, and he got expert opinions. No one was wrong. It's just that everyone said, go home and, and put your affairs in order. And he came to me and one of my colleagues in surgery biopsied the liver, massive liver uh, overtaken by tumor. And he was strangely sensitive to a three drug combination I was working on. Now it wasn't a standard of care. Most people wouldn't, I mean, no one would have given it to him, but it worked perfectly. In fact, it worked so perfectly that he was cured. And he's now three years off treatment, 10 years, around now, I think April will be 10 years since diagnosis. So. And that's it's amazing an for pancreatic cancer. Amazing. It's, it's, it's amazing is exactly right. And I don't want to overstate that. It isn't like I do that every time. But we do get very prolonged survivals in some of our pancreas patients. We've had patients go out multiple years. I had another patient who, who went out about uh, seven years. Now, unfortunately, as you said, lurking stem cells, it is possible that these people, even at the very end of their seven and 10 years, they may still have a cancer cell somewhere. We, uh, we don't know. But in this patient's case, after prolonged post-operative care and adjuvant and maintenance, we finally just about three years ago stopped everything. His wife, who's a nurse, was very afraid to stop at all. We had kept him on an every six-week dose of relatively low chemotherapy. He never suffered toxicity. But we finally just stopped, and they've never seen recurrence. So, so that's an excellent story. I have a, another very interesting and very current story, which is – to me, very gratifying. Um, some years ago, I took care of a woman from Utah, and she had a very aggressive breast cancer. She was so anxious to get what I was offering that she commuted from Utah to California for me to treat her for the six months it took. She achieved a complete durable remission and is perfectly well. She referred a woman to me from Missouri. And I thought, well, that's awfully far for someone to come to see me, but she did. The woman flew here. And when I met her, I, I, it was just June of this year, when I met her, 
I had never met her before, and I, and I met her in the radiology department where we performed a fluid aspiration to remove cancer uh, to study. Uh, fluids that have cancer in them can be very good sources. So we did what's called a pleural uh, thoracentesis, a fluid removal, and, and it was extremely, extremely full of cancer cells. When we isolated them and studied them, it turned out that she has something called HER2 positive breast cancer, HER2. So HER2 breast cancer is almost uniformly treated with the same combination today. There was a trial called the Cleopatra trial. They gave a combination of Receptin uh, with a taxa tier uh, to which we now added Progetta. So this is two antibodies and a chemo. And this is the standard of care and everybody gives it. And this is what she would have gotten, except in the test tube, she was not sensitive. And actually I was a little bit shocked because I probably would have recommended it. So I sat down and I looked over the results and instead of the drug that would normally be used, a drug that I had tested and reported in 1999 at a San Antonio breast cancer meeting, turned out to be demonstrably better. So we crafted a treatment that was unique to her need and uh, treated her. Now she had a tumor, I, I describe it as, a, as a, a mass in the right breast that looked like an eggplant. I mean, it was a purple mass, the size of an eggplant. She had pleural effusions and such extensive bony metastasis that I did MRIs to make sure she would not collapse her, her bones, the vertebrae. We started her on treatment and she remained in California to get the first and eighth day of treatment. She went back to Missouri and then came back and got her second cycle. And by the end of the second cycle, we did another PET scan. Not only was the breast demonstrably better, but the PET scan now looked much better. We finished, oh, oh after that, the doctors, um, in St. Louis uh, offered to then continue my treatment. In the beginning, they said, oh, no, no, we won't give this. But once they saw how good it worked, they gave it to her and she finished her sixth cycle. And last week she came out to see me and a PET scan is clean. Perfect. Now explain how PET scan, is it, is it still true that it can pick up the smallest amount of a metastases of any imaging? Well, PET scan is very sensitive picks up any area of active disease and is very, very good to monitor progress because as cells die, sometimes they shrink, but they don't necessarily stop my metabolic viability. PET scan picks up whether they're alive or not. Now it's not perfect because the tumor volume has to be about a cubic centimeter or somewhere in that vicinity to be picked up. But hers was like a, she lit up like a Christmas tree the first time. So that when we got the second or third PET scan that was completely clean and all of her tumor markers were normal and all of her chemistries were normal and her breast had returned to normal and there's no fluid in the lung, I'm confident that she's achieved a complete remission. Now the question is, can we keep her in complete remission. So we're gonna maintain her on just antibodies, the Progetta, Progetta and Herceptin. And I've added to that a drug called Everolimus, which is a, a metabolic inhibitor. Can you and, say and that a little, little slower so everyone can understand that and I, explain I've it added again? In, into the mix a drug called Everolimus, which is okay. sold commercially as Affinitor. And the reason okay. we did that was because there are published data and her profile that strongly supported this rather unusual regimen. When I saw the patient most recently, I told her that she's the first person in the world to have ever received this combination. So that's real, true, personalized cancer care. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, how many people do you see a day and a week? What does your clinic look like? What is your day like? Kind of interested to know the day in the life of somebody who's working like you do. Well, in the past, we saw more patients in person. But as the COVID-19 has set in, we've moved more toward uh, consulting with patients uh, telephonically or by uh, Zoom video. And so we will do sometimes two or three or four consults in a day. Our intent is to identify ways to help people by conducting a biopsy. I have a patient who flew here the other day from Indianapolis, and she's, uh, I guess, just about right now getting a biopsy. She has a very large breast mass. When we find the treatment for her, we will communicate with her physicians. Uh, I think she's gonna be receiving care through one of my colleagues in Chicago. So she came here specifically for us to conduct the biopsy. We like patients to come here once, if possible, if they need it. We will do the biopsies because we always get our, get our tumor. We always get our man, like the Royal Canadian <laughs> Mounted Police. And we always get a good, as best we can, we always get the good sample. And then we send back to their doctors the treatment. For example, I mentioned the woman who went back to St. Louis. Once we had shown that this treatment was ideally effective for her, 
even their misgivings, because they were telling her, oh, this is a crazy idea and don't do this. Now I understand that when she's coming in to see the people at the Barnes Hospital, they bring the students in to see this example of a good outcome. So yeah, we like to work with doctors anywhere. We want people to, we want patients to enjoy their life. I want to be the architect of their care. I don't need to be their contractor. So what we want to do is design the treatment. This is far reaching, but that colleague in Chicago isn't Keith Block, is it? Do you know it Keith? Is Keith Block. It's oh, sure. Keith Block. Oh my gosh. So so when I had breast cancer many, many years ago, Keith was my very first doctor. I had a number of different doctors, but Keith and I have ended up becoming very collegial and together. And um I was wonderful. wondering if it was because yeah. he he initiated the chemo light where he was giving them in different dosages so that there was less hair falling out and so forth. And he's, he's such a smart gentleman and he's really smart plus heart. He's incredible. And his wife, Penny is amazing. They're just, I know them both. Well, yeah, Keith has been a great ally. And we did not know that each other had known this person. I just, for some reason, I I had this intuitive little uh, feeling to ask you this. I, I have another very nice story that involves Keith Block and, and it's a similar sort of story and, it, and it's also instructive. Uh, a very nice fellow. And there was an ABC News coverage of this patient. You can look that up. We can get you the link. But this gentleman, a very tall gentleman from Des Moines, traveled to Texas, one of the major cancer centers in the country is in Texas. Houston, so MD Anderson. MD right. Anderson, yeah. And he went to Texas. And I mean, they're very excellent. And I don't have any criticism of that. But they gave him a standard treatment. And it didn't work. So they said, okay, we're going to give you second line standard treatment. And he said, well, wait a minute. I mean, I've traveled all the way to Texas to get the world's best Wizard of Oz therapy, and and you're just giving me something out of the textbook. So he heard about us, and he flew here uh, to California. We did a biopsy. He had a lymph node up in the neck. We did a biopsy. And lo and behold, he had a very unusual pattern. He had a pattern that would be more like a lung cancer. So I crafted a regimen for him that would be almost What do you mean he had a pattern more like a lung cancer? What does that mean? The tissue culture sensitivity, oh, the drugs okay. that we were finding, the agents that oh, work, okay. looked more the way you might treat a lung cancer. So I thought, well, this is an adenocarcinoma of the, of the esophagus, but it's behaving like a lung cancer. Okay. So one of my dictums is that drugs don't know what diseases they were invented for. So when you find a drug working, I mean, the drug, you know, they're agnostic. The drug has no idea what it's supposed to work for. It just works when it works. So we crafted a regimen, and here he, he lives in Des Moines, but he he drove to Chicago so that Keith's team, Dr. Nimagata actually, could treat him with a regimen that we crafted, and he had a brilliant response. The trouble is he developed a little bit of a toxicity. One of the drugs caused neuropathy. So we went back into our bag of tricks, and we realized that we could substitute, now that we've gotten a good remission, substitute a different drug that didn't have that neuropathy effect. And now a year plus, a year and a half almost, he's been in remission. And it was, and they, I mean, this is someone they would give up on. I just, this is incredible. And you're hearing, you're you're having the opportunity, if you're sitting and listening to this show, to hear a thinker that's changing people's lives. And this really makes such sense because if you get cancer and they're throwing at you what they throw at everybody, which is what I've had happen to me numerous times. I'm not going to waste our time with my old stories, but I've lived that. I was one of the first cases of pure mucinous adenocarcinoma among the other many cancers I had because my mother was given diethylstrobestrol when she was pregnant with me and a lot of the offspring have immune issues and um, they wanted to treat me exactly the way they treat everybody else. And so that's a whole long story, but I've lived what that feels like. And many patients don't even know that's what they're getting, but for someone like you to be able to break through that concrete of paradigm thinking and initiate what makes so such total sense and now be inaugurating it and writing papers on it and having patience with it, I mean, this is the way cancer care should look from here on in. So do you have a patent on this or how is it that you, besides seeing patients, how do you monetize your hard work and your research in some way that gives back to you as you are giving to others? Well, we have to charge for our service and we try to make it as affordable as possible. It's often out of pocket for a patient. 
So we don't want it to be onerous. For someone to save their life, they shouldn't have to spend an enormous amount of money. Generally, our tests do not exceed $5,000 in fees. And once you get one, it's it's good for prolonged use. So, I mean, it's a one- With that primary cancer. If you got a different with- primary cancer, then you'd have to get that- Again, God if forbid. Recurs, yeah, if it recurs, particularly if there's been a prolonged time in between or a lot of treatment in between, sometimes we have to repeat the test. Yeah, but but we, we're not highly profitable, but we cover our costs for the most part. I'm a little bit, I'm a medical doctor, and my, my goal is to provide good outcome for patients. I mean, I, I, I think of myself as an old-fashioned doctor. And so it's very gratifying for me to see patients like this young woman with this terrible breast cancer. I mean, I saved her life. There's no question. She has twins, young twins at home. If I had not stepped in, I fear she will die of this. I think now she will live, if not cured, then many, many years. So that's very gratifying. Um, In order to to cover our costs, we have to charge for this. Um, I am engaged in other areas of investigation that may someday be uh, uh, more lucrative. Uh, Currently, we're we're not highly successful, but we're very successful in terms of our clinical outcomes. Do you ever test alternative interventions, you know, like mistletoe or this or that, or is it mainly chemotherapeutic pharmaceuticals? We have a dictum, anything that works. And so Iscador, uh, other natural products, we've tested, uh, we've tested dozens of natural products. As you might imagine, many compounds, many substances have important medicinal properties, curcuminoids, uh, other uh, chemicals from the, from the natural environment. One of the problems for them, however, is that they're not strong, they're not highly potent. For example, curcuminoids are very interesting um, uh, from turmeric. These are, these are natural products we find in, in the environment. Um, they're, they're very active. Um, the uh, resveratrol, uh, there are so many interesting compounds. Resveratrol influences histone acetylation. There are many biochemical uh, phenomena. We've tested betulinic acid. We've tested boswellic acid. We've tested millions of things, but they don't have potent toxic effects in short term. Not to say they don't have biological effects. I think to some degree, these are areas under the curve. A lifestyle that incorporates these types of substances over time is healthful. Are they meaningful therapeutics? Some of them, some of them. But many of them are just not strong enough, potent enough, direct enough to induce cell death. And after all, our laboratory is a measure of program cell death. Have you tried 2-methoxyestradiol, 2-MeO? I know it very well. Uh, that's the byproduct of, uh, of estradiol metabolism uh, uh, that can be influenced by indole-3-carbinol uh, and diendolomethane. And, and we worked in that area and worked with uh, a colleague to develop methane. Actually, a colleague of mine in the Czech Republic synthesized most of the methane that is in use today. So we know that area of chemistry. Um, uh, metho- methoxy, is, uh, 2-methoxy is uh, anti-vascular. And this is actually stuff that was looked at, and I think, Jonah, uh, some years ago, um, they were studying Rakesh Jain and the group at Dana-Farber were actually studying that substance. It's, it's a very interesting compound and is the byproduct of, of certain SIP uh, uh, metabolism at the level of the metabolism. There, there are many estradiol metabolized. There's 2-hydroxy, 16-hydroxy. Right, the catechol uh, estrogens, so, right. Yeah. So, yes, I mean, a very interesting substance, and it has antiangenic properties, and uh, uh, I, I don't, we've never seen potent cytotoxic effects. I did test it years ago, but I didn't see cell killing. Not to say it's not a reasonable substance, but it doesn't have cell killing effects in short term. Interesting. So now that you deal with saving people's lives or people really striving to stay alive, how do you live your life differently from your own vocation? You mean, does it, does it bleed into my, into my emotional well-being? I don't, well, I don't know. You know, you see that people um, are ill and they're fighting for their lives. So I wonder if you live a little bit differently because of what you witness every day at work and what you do. I think you I have do. children, uh, how you guide them. I, uh, I wrote a book some years ago called uh, uh, Outliving Cancer. And in the beginning of the book, I tell a story about being a trainee and about, about entering into my studies of cancer medicine and that all my patients were dying. And I felt personally wounded 
that I couldn't save their lives because I'd come from a residency where I was a very accomplished doctor. I felt very good as a, a, a trainee here in California. When I came, went to Washington, D.C., and I was doing my fellowship at Georgetown, the patients were so advanced, the treatments were so toxic, the experience was so dispiriting that I was, I mean, I was incredibly depressed. And I finally had a kind of apotheosis and epiphany that I didn't cause the cancer. It wasn't like I forgot to look in the rear view mirror and ran over someone's son or, yeah, I mean, I didn't do anything bad. They got a bad problem and I was trying to help them. And it allowed me to go back and fight the fight because I felt that I, I was on the right side. I might lose battles, but I was on the side of good. And that one of the reasons that I went into what I do now was because I found it so disappointing that we were using these crude, blunt instruments badly. And I said, there's got to be a better way to do this. And that's when I set up my first laboratory to study this at Georgetown. And my second year of fellowship, I spent in the laboratory of molecular pharmacology studying tissue culture. And I wrote my first papers and I presented my first abstracts. And in the very beginning, I did it in leukemia. And I showed that we could pr improve the outcome of leukemia patients. And then I began to move into solid tumors. And, and so, yes, it's affected my life because I feel immensely blessed not to have cancer. <laughs> and I feel, I, I think it's, it's my wife who's also in oncology. And I often say, no matter what happens, and no matter what, our, we have two boys, and whenever they would do anything really dumb or something bad would happen, we would just say, well, at least we don't have leukemia. I mean, you know, you're, 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 we're well. You, we, there's so much bad that could happen, and if you, if you're surviving all this, and yes, I lead a very healthy life. I eat well. I exercise regularly. I'm a rower, and and I. I'm a boater. <laughs> I'm not a sculler, but I canoe and paddle. I'm this. I right. got to be on the water and move. Yep. Right, right, and so yeah, it does affect my life, and it does influence the way I see things, but um. I love what I do. I, I, you know, when you have one story like this young woman from Missouri and she just turns on a dime and goes from dying to perfectly well, it's very gratifying. It's, it's very rewarding. In fact, since I don't get a lot of financial reward, it is the one reward I really do cherish in my patient outcomes. So what's the response from the oncologists around you that don't do interventions like you do? And why aren't, how, how does that work? Well, I think I'm disruptive. Because you see, medical oncology today, <clears throat> particularly that uh, conducted through university centers, is driven by protocol. Everybody goes on something that standardizes the care. And we're looking to standardized treatment for cost and for projections and for resource utilization and for resource allocation. So there's a kind of top-down thinking about medicine. The, um, the problem with that is that there are no average patients. So when you use average treatments for average patients, you get average outcomes, which currently gives response rates in the range of 30 to 40 percent in most diseases, which I consider completely unacceptable. So yeah, I'm disrupting the paradigm and I'm I'm causing people to rethink things. Secondly, I read a great deal about a lot of things. So I don't look at a patient like, oh, we give this drug or we give that drug. I look at them as a pathway, as a phenomenon, as a biological experiment in real time. So I look at what, where did this patient's cell go wrong? What did it do different? And so the drugs we have are really nothing more than probes. They're like, well, are you ticklish? Is this cancer cell responsive to platinum? Is it a DNA damage repair issue? Or is it a mitotic spindle issue? Or is it, a, is it a metabolism issue? Is it a mitochondrial issue? So cancer isn't cancer. Cancer are collections of biological events that we need to address. And, and so when I see a patient, what I'm most interested in is I like to start at the genomic level. Not that I love genomics. In fact, I don't but I like them as a starting point, the same way you like to read the map before you put the Google traffic pattern on it, you know where the roads are. So we, we look at patients as maps. And then we layer, with my technique, we layer the Google map on, I hope I'm not gonna get in trouble for using Google map, but, but I mean, we layer the functionality, the biological reality of the road so that you just 
you don't just know the roads there, you know there's a traffic jam or construction or a plane crash. So we're trying to maneuver a more accurate approach. And, and that disrupts a lot of people's work because everybody wants standardized care. And, and the patients want individualized care. And I, and I think there's an enormous crash coming between yes. what people want and what people are getting. It's and so unfair because standardized care, I really think it's for litigious reasons, because if you have someone on the stand and they're not doing standard of care, you can sue them. But standard of care is not agile thinking and not addressing the individual patient. It's a crime. And I love the way you put that. We're in the road for a crash. And unfortunately, that patient is in the center of that traffic jam. It's just not fair. What you're doing is so great. Having been a victim myself or having... Uh, the desire to have agile thinkers on my show. And I know a lot of people are very excited by the way you're speaking. If they want to read your book, do you have one or two books? I think, I don't know exactly what you have. So can you let us know? We're going to put the links to your clinic. We're going to put the links to your book or books that you're going to now mention on the air, because I know that people are sitting on the edge of their seat. They have some loved ones that have cancer. And if they have active cancer right now, they really want them to come out to Irvine, California and see you. Hmm. Well, we're in Long Beach, and oh, uh, Long Beach. Okay, there yeah. you go. Don't go to Irvine. <laughs> no, well, I, 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 I you went to Irvine, but you. But I, I lect and I lecture. I lecture at the university. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, we wrote a, the book. I've written books, but the one that anyone would want to read would be Outliving Cancer, and that can okay. you can get that on Amazon. And Outliving Cancer is basically um, looking. Uh, at cancer biology through the through the lens of individual patient stories. What was this patient's problem? What did we do about it? And why did it work? And it's also an overview of cancer biology, a little bit of description of how my career has unfolded and some of the discoveries we've made. And that was published uh, several years ago. I'm in the process of writing a new book, which is sort of an update of those ways of thinking. And that should be finished very soon. It's actually in its final draft. Do you know the I name of that book yet? I haven't come up with a name yet. So okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm just working on it. But um, yes, we'd love that. And also <clears throat> the Nagorni, <clears throat> excuse me, Nagorni Cancer Institute website is a, a, a good source of information. And we're just in the process of updating that. We want it to be a little more user-friendly and a little more navigable. Um, and there are many um, news coverages. I wrote an editorial last year in the Wall Street Journal. It's just a one-page editorial that's entitled, it's from July of 19, and it's entitled, Every Cancer Patient is One in a Billion. And it's the story of how we need to begin to look at people individually. Um, so yes, we are very active here. We uh, we are very happy to meet with patients. As I mentioned, people travel from all over the world. I have patients coming from Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil regularly. We have patients coming from Europe. I just got a phone call early this morning from the Netherlands. Um, and we're happy to treat and help anyone we can. Cancer medicine in my opinion, needs to be better and it needs to be more patient oriented. And the doctors have to be advocates for their patients and they have to stop um, treating on standardized protocols. They're not working. And we, and we need to more aggressively pursue individual patient needs uh, using platforms like mine. And I just want to clarify, they would need to come to your institute and get their particular set of tumor cells checked. Just because you hear that you have her to new and somebody else had her to new, that doesn't overlap. I just want to set this straight because someone might think, well, my girlfriend had the same profiling on her tumor type, but that's not what you're talking about. They really need to get their individual tumor tested. Is that correct? Right. Well, we will process tissue from afar. We have contractual relationships in Brazil, in Bahrain. We've worked oh. with patients from India. We will transport tissue from wherever the patient is. However, what we like to do is to get cells that are not, we don't like people to go through too invasive a procedure for us. After all, we can't guarantee we're going to give a result and we'd hate to have someone go through a big procedure and then not get a good answer. But uh, if a patient is going to surgery, if a patient is having fluid removed, if a patient is having an aspiration or a lymph node excision, they're very welcome to contact us. We will ship them a kit and they can transport by overnight courier. We process samples from all over the world and we will get the results back to them and their physicians by seven days. That's really incredible. Thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate your work. I wish I would have known you earlier in my life, but it's all turned out well for me. I'm pretty lucky about that. Um, 
I, it's an honor to speak with you. Is there any final words that you might want to say to the audience that's listening? I know on the edge of their seat. Um, the only thing I can say is that when a person gets a diagnosis of cancer, it is rarely an opportunity to get an MD PhD. So they need someone to guide them with the sophistication and understanding and biological scientific uh, knowledge so that they can make smart decisions that they themselves would like made for them. It's a, it's a kind of golden rule of cancer medicine. So from my standpoint, what I say to patients is if you can't get an MD PhD to figure your own problems out, I'll apply my scientific abilities to do my best for you. The only thing I need is a little piece of the patient's tissue to make definitive decisions. And we will do that for any patient in need. We even provide some of these services for patients who are financially strapped. Sometimes we can provide some foundation support to help them. No patient should go without the right treatment. It, it, everybody deserves the right treatment. And the closer to diagnosis, the better the chance of getting meaningful and even curative outcomes. So yeah, we say every patient should take charge of their disease and make their best decisions as soon as possible after diagnosis. And if they if they know they have cancer or if a biopsy has shown cancer and they're going to have a surgery or a biopsy or something, call us. Call us. We can test it. We'll get a sample. We'll run it. And a week later, they'll know a lot more. They'll know a lot more than their doctors. This is a breath of fresh air and chaotic dissonant times. It is so refreshing to speak with a sane, smart plus heart physician. Thank you so much for all your work and everybody out there. If you love this show, if you know people who have cancer, and I know that you probably do, please pass this show forward. I'm going to listen to the show myself <clears throat> several times. You've said so much information in a short period of time. You're so eloquent I really appreciate who you are very, very much. Well, I appreciate you having me on. I'm, I'm very happy to get the word out to patients. We think this is important. Okay, well, you stay well, and may all your family stay well, and have a happy, safe Thanksgiving. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.